As employees of a company committed to workplace safety, we're familiar with the common features of safe working environments. Guardrails installed to prevent falls. Adequate ventilation is provided to ensure clean air. Electrical and mechanical hazards are kept at a distance or placed behind guarding. And easy access to exits are maintained should an emergency arise. However, the configuration of some areas don't allow for these types of safety precautions. I can't move. In certain areas, employees may be forced to work very close to hazards. Proper guarding may not exist to prevent falls. The air may be toxic, explosive, or oxygen deficient. And in addition, there may be no easy way to exit the area should an emergency arise. If you're thinking this type of work area sounds dangerous, you're right. These types of work areas are called confined spaces, and learning how to safely work in these spaces is the purpose of this program. The term confined space is more than just a description of an awkward work area. It's a term developed by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, to define specific types of work areas. A confined space is any space that meets the following conditions. The space is not designed for continuous human occupancy. It is large enough for an employee to enter and perform work and has limited egress, which means a restricted ability to enter and exit the space. Some common types of confined spaces include pits, silos, tanks, pipes, and vessels. And while confined spaces come in various sizes and configurations, they all have one thing in common they can be very dangerous. Many deaths and injuries have occurred in confined spaces when workers fail to recognize the presence of potential hazards and did not take the appropriate measures to protect themselves. To help protect workers from the hazards of working in confined spaces, the company has developed a written confined space entry program. This program is available for employee review and is based on the confined space regulations developed by OSHA. As part of the written plan, the company has evaluated and identified all confined spaces on site and maintains a list of them in the written plan. Confined spaces are generally classified in one of two ways, permit required confined spaces and non-permit required confined spaces. Spaces classified as non-permit required confined spaces do not have the potential to contain serious hazards and no special procedures are required to enter them. Conversely, permit-required confined spaces have the potential to contain serious safety and health hazards. As the name implies, permit-required confined spaces require a written permit to be issued and specific procedures be followed before entry is allowed. In this program, we will discuss permit-required spaces and give an overview of the entry permit system while discussing key safety issues involved with entering permit-required confined spaces. While every permit-required confined space is unique, there are some common hazards they may share. One common hazard is the potential for the air inside the space to be hazardous. This condition is referred to as an atmospheric hazard. For example, if the oxygen level of the air is below 19.5%, there is not enough oxygen available for effective breathing. This is referred to as an oxygen deficient atmosphere. When the air contains oxygen levels above 23.5%, the atmosphere becomes oxygen enriched. Because oxygen is a required component for fire, an oxygen enriched atmosphere creates an extreme fire hazard. Explosive atmospheres are also created when any flammable gas, vapor or mist exceeds 10% of its lower explosive limit. In addition, combustible dust, such as grain or flour, can also create an explosive atmosphere. Atmospheres are also considered hazardous when the presence of toxic substances could result in employee exposure above the permissible exposure limits. When an atmosphere is so hazardous that it poses an immediate danger to life and health, it is referred to as an IDLH atmosphere. IDLH means immediate danger to life and health. Because most confined spaces are part of working systems and processes, they may contain mechanical or electrical hazards related to its normal operation.
Moving parts, such as mixing or cutting blades, rotating shafts, or similar items are highly dangerous to confined space entrance. In addition, some spaces may contain engulfment hazards. Engulfment hazards exist when materials could be released into the space covering any entrance. Another type of hazard is caused by the design of some confined space vessels. Sloping walls and floors present serious danger to personnel who may become trapped in tight spaces. These are just a few of the hazards which may be found inside confined spaces. The company's entry permit system ensures these types of hazards are controlled during every entry operation. The company's entry permit system is a system used to control confined space hazards and ensure worker safety during the entry process. The written entry permit contains information necessary for a successful entry and includes the following information. Okay, the permit says it's this one, lift station number four. The identity of the space to be entered. Entering the wrong space can be a fatal mistake. A list of personnel involved in the entry process. Vic, you're the attendant, and Ben, you're the entrant. And their responsibilities. The permit says there may be increased levels of methane in the pit. We'll test for that and ventilate if necessary. The listing of any potential hazards contained in the space, as well as specific testing and isolation measures required to control them. The acceptable conditions for entry and the results of any atmospheric testing used to certify the space as safe to enter. Winch. Yep. Lifeline. Yep. The entry no, operation may require specific personal protective equipment, specialized tools, or rescue Lifeline. devices be on hand. If so, radios. they will be listed on the permit. Good. The, the personnel involved in the entry process are referred to as the entry team. Each member of the entry team must sign the permit to indicate they know and understand the information it contains. Entering a permit required confined space is a team effort and each team member has specific duties. The entry team consists of the following members. The entry supervisor, the attendant, and the entrance. The written permit serves as a checklist for safe entry operations, and the entry supervisor makes sure the process is followed. The entry supervisor makes sure all appropriate notations have been made on the permit, and that all atmospheric testing specified by the permit has been conducted. To control electrical, mechanical, or engulfment hazards, isolation procedures such as lockout-tagout may be required. When this is the case, the entry supervisor must verify they have been completed. The entry supervisor is also responsible for making sure any required protective equipment, tools, or rescue devices are on hand before entry. The entry supervisor must confirm the availability of the this confined rescue. space rescue team and verify that the means to summon them is working properly. Every entry into a permit required confined space requires a properly trained rescue team be available. The rescue team is trained to conduct confined space rescue in the actual space being entered. After satisfying all pre-entry conditions listed on the permit, the entry supervisor must sign the permit indicating he has approved the entry to begin. The entry permit must specify a specific time period for which it's valid. At appropriate intervals during the entry process, the entry supervisor must confirm that the entry remains consistent with the terms of the entry permit. Should the entry supervisor determine that any part of the entry process has fallen outside the requirements of the entry permit, he must cancel the permit and the space must be evacuated. The second member of the entry team is the attendant, sometimes called the standby attendant. The attendant acts as the eyes and ears of the entry process, monitoring conditions both inside and outside the space, as well as the condition of the entrance. During the entry process, the attendant must maintain an accurate count of the entrance inside the space and be able to accurately identify who is inside the space at any time. To properly monitor entry conditions, the attendant must maintain contact with the entrance. This contact which may be visual or by sound, allows either the entrant or attendant to call for an immediate evacuation of the space when necessary. The attendant should call for an evacuation anytime conditions prohibited by the entry permit are detected 
or when an infant exhibits behavioral symptoms that indicate possible exposure to a dangerous condition. Once the attendant determines an infant must be evacuated, he must notify all other infants to evacuate as well. If the hazardous condition has been discovered quickly enough, the entrant may be able to evacuate the space under his own power. However, if an entrant becomes incapacitated and cannot evacuate the space on his own, the attendant should immediately call the rescue team for assistance and attempt to conduct a non-entry rescue. Rescue, I've got an emergency. I've got a man passed out down in lift station number four. I'm gonna start hoisting him out now. Please respond. A non-entry rescue means using external means, such as a lifeline attached to a harness, to remove the entrant from the space. The attendant must not enter the confined space while attempting a rescue. This is a critically important point, so we'll state it again. The standby attendant must not enter the confined space while attempting a rescue. If a non-entry rescue is not possible, the attendant must remain outside the space, keeping other personnel from entering the space until the rescue team arrives. The third component of the entry team are the confined space entrants. The entrants are the only ones authorized to enter the space. Like all team members, entrants must know and understand any potential hazards they may face during the entry process and be familiar with the warning signs and symptoms of exposure to dangerous conditions. Entrants may request to observe any atmospheric testing used to certify the space is safe to enter. Once inside, the entrant must maintain communications with the standby attendant so the attendant can monitor his condition and the status of the operation. Should the attendant or entry supervisor call for an evacuation, the entrant must immediately exit the space. The entrant also has a responsibility to monitor the conditions inside the space and call for an evacuation anytime he discovers a condition prohibited by the permit or recognizes any warning signs or symptoms of exposure to hazardous conditions. Each member of the entry team has a specific role to play in the entry process. By following the requirements of the entry permit system, the entry team is able to work safely in confined spaces. Confined space entry requires knowledge, training, skill, and strict adherence to procedures for a safe and successful entry to be achieved. This program has provided an overview of permit-required confined space entry operations. The members of the entry team will be given specific training before participating in confined space entry operations. No matter what role you play in the entry process, make sure you understand your duties and have the knowledge and skills necessary to perform them properly. Each day at work, we enter into a conflict against workplace injury. And in this battle, victory can only be achieved by maintaining a positive attitude about safety, refusing to perform unsafe acts, and following safe work practices each and every time. Thank you.